All right, um, welcome to this event by the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. My name is Georg Gange. I'm the center's coordinator, but I will also be today's moderator. More importantly, today's speaker is Adam Timmins um, with the topic, a Heath Robinson contraption, question mark, some problem with Roth's irrealism, which is a great topic for us today at the Center of Philosophical Studies of History, because obviously, um, as most of you know, realism, irrealism, anti-realism, and what have you are hotly debated issues currently in the philosophy of history. Um, Adam's main research interests lie in the philosophy of history, and here especially in questions of realism and here and anti-realism, and also in the philosophy of science, and here especially in the philosophy of Thomas Kuhn. Institutionally, um, Adam will soon begin a postdoc at the newly established Center for Philosophical Studies of Historiography at the University of Ol uh, Ol University of Ostrava, same letter, in the Czech Republic, um, which gives me the opportunity to recommend this sister institution of our center in Olu to all of you. You should definitely check it out if you haven't done so. I think there will be a lot of stuff, good stuff coming out of Ostrava in the future very soon. Um, now, of Adam's publications, I only want to mention a few here, which have a bearing on today's topic. Um, in 2022, he published uh, Towards a Realist Philosophy of History, which I can show you here in print, because I just reviewed the book, um, which came out in 2022 with um, Lexington Books. And be besides that, Adam has also contributed two texts to the even more recent anthology from um, 2023, The Poverty of Anti-Realism, Critical Perspectives on Postmodernist Philosophy of History. Um, and these texts are called Idealism in Historical Theory, 1970 to 2020, and Irrealism Irreal 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 and Historical Theory, A User's Guide. Now, um, this is the second session of our uh, spring seminar of 2024. Um, after today, the seminar will continue on April 11 with Matthias Slavov from our very own University of Oulu, speaking about um, metaphysics of time lurking within historiography, considering the in parentheses equal existence of past, present, and future. And then um, there will still be a fourth session of our seminar, fourth and last on May 28, when we will have Sef Kidoan from the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa in Italy, um, speaking about in between Hegel and Marx, Gramsci and Storis, Storicismo Assoluto, in parentheses, absolute historicism. Uh, and some of you who follow us very closely might wonder, um, we originally also had a fifth um, talk lined up in our uh, seminar. On April 25, um, Su Yao was supposed to speak on um, in what sense is astronomy a historical science? But unfortunately, this um, event has to be postponed and will probably now be held in, 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 uh, in autumn. Now, if you want to stay updated about the center's activities, our talks, we do much more. Please consider following us on social media. We have Facebook and X, formerly Twitter. And of course, our homepage is also always updated. Now, now bear with me, now I'm nearly done. Um, just a few technicalities. Um, please mute yourself during Adam's talk to avoid any unnecessary disturbance. After the talk, um, which I think will talk, uh, take roughly around 45 minutes, according to Adam, um, we will have discussion session. If you have any question, comments, concerns, criticism in a discussion session, um, please indicate so first in the chat. I will make a speaker's list. Um, when it's your turn, you can either speak up with or without your camera on, or you can write a question in the chat, and then I will read it out loud. And we will prioritize people who have not spoken yet, so they will move up on the speaker's list. So um, thank you very much, Adam, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Okay, peace up, chai town down. Okay, first of all, thank you, uh, Georg, for uh, for inviting me, and um, um, thank you to all of those of you who've come along. I know you normally do this on the the last Thursday of the month. Is that is that right? Yes, but yeah, yes. but but as I say, I'm I'm going to be in um, Chicago next week. In fact, uh, this time next week, hopefully, I'll be at the the guaranteed rate field for the uh, for the opening day of the baseball season, weather permitting. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> So let me just, sorry, I'm surrounded by a bank of screens here, which have various things on. So if you see me looking off into the middle distance, there's, there is a reason for this. So, yeah. So I want to talk today about irrealism. And um, I mean, interestingly, as I was sort of uh, reviewing some of the literature this past week, it seems as this has sort of disappeared from uh, Roth's work in a sense after the past. I mean, yes, he talks about it in his book, but that's kind of, recycled collection of essays. Um, so this may well be a piece of historical philosophy, as it were, but um, I think it's still worth doing. Um, 
For a couple of reasons. Firstly, you know, I've often found that sort of Roth's references to irrealism in his papers are very sort of passing and, you know, they, they make it out to be this sort of jejune doctrine as opposed to, um, you know, the radical metaphysical thesis that it essentially um, is. And, but I mean, also, I think it's it's also important to kind of, you have to understand the roots of all this, right? The, where all this is coming from. Um, and that, of course, is via uh, Quine. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I mean, the Heath the Heath Robinson reference, which I'm sure had you all sort of scrambling to your Google um, search engines to to look at what that was. I mean, it was one of those things when I sort of got the the nod to to give this paper. So I thinking about it, the thing that had always struck me about the paper, the pasts in particular, is that you know there's an awful lot of moving parts here, right? You know that in order for this to come off, you've got uh, Goldstein's view of you know historiographical constitution. Uh, Goodman's realism, Roth's reading of Danto, uh, Ian Hacking's dynamic nominalism. So you've got all these moving pieces in play and providing they're all unproblematic and they do their job, um, then everything's fine, right? Um, unfortunately, they aren't, or at least um, I have argued here and elsewhere that this is the, um, the case. So, <clears throat> so let's begin then with, um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what is realism and how does it differ from realism and anti-realism because realism because this is one of Roth's key claims right that this is a kind of a a third way uh, as it were it's, it's not realism it's not anti-realism it's irrealism um so uh, irrealism certainly as as the way goodman <clears throat> presents it is best sort of characterized as a kind of extreme nominalism right so whereas a sort of a common or garden nominalist believes that there are you know, no shareable properties or universals amongst the the world's fundamental entities. Irrealism goes a step further and denies the existence of the particularized properties as well. Um, so irrealism denies the fundamentum fundamentality of any kind of property, whether universal or particular. So here's one way to look at it. The realist believes that the world has properties, a, a structure, uh, independently of the way that we represent it, and that when we represent it successfully, we get at what the world is like, you know, carving nature at the joints, writing the book of the world, whatever. Um, the anti-realist concedes the idea of an independent world, but notes that as it is always mediated by our representations, we can never get outside of these sort of representations, you know, to get a side on look to see if they correspond or not. Um, and so objects and properties are, in a sense, always representation dependent. What a realism does is a set, essentially collapse the distinction between the world and the representations. Representations and properties are not metaphysically distinct um, from the objects. So realism and anti-realism can both hold between a, distinct, uh, a distinction between scheme and content in their own way. Whereas, you know, certainly on Goodman's view, it's impossible to tell where one ends and another begins. Any line we draw between scheme and content is arbitrary. You know, your brute fact is my convention. Um, but I mean, there has to be a little bit more than this, because ultimately this is just idealism, right? So allied to this is the notion that the world is kind of a, a featureless substratum. As Goodman himself puts it, what is it that is so organized? When we strip off the layers of convention, all differences, if we strip off as layers of convention, all differences amongst ways of describing it, what is left? The onion is peeled down to its empty core. So the realist wants to argue that there is one way the world is. The anti-realist slash idealist wants to say that we have many different ways of representing the same world. The irrealist says that different representations correspond to different worlds. And so this is where the, the rubber meets the road, right? Different representations correspond to different worlds. Yes, that's a good question. Excuse me, Adam. Are you, do, you, do you have a PowerPoint? Do you mean to show it? Somebody asks in the, in the because it doesn't show. Yes, I'm going to, when I come to my first... Oh, okay, when, yeah, you, but, yeah. when you can, sorry, okay. There was some yeah, so, so confusion I'm not going to about... Use, no, no, okay. okay, so I'm not going to use it for the whole thing because okay. I've, I've been PowerPointed to death for the last 15 years. I'm sure we all have. But when I've got a, a salient quote, I'm going to put it up on the uh, on the screen. But um, Okay, great, thanks. Uh, you know, yeah, but till then, you can look at my beautiful features. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> 
So now we know that sort of what needs to be in place for this theory to be neither realism or anti-realism, but um, irrealism. There can be no structure to get at, no pre-existing properties in the past, not due to any kind of epistemological limitations, but due to the fact that such things, you know, that the properties that we're after simply do not exist independently of our constitution of them. So, as I said, we have all this stuff about in Roth's papers about, you know, there's Goodman and there's Danto and Goldstein and all that good stuff. But, you know, we need to talk about Quine, right? So here comes the PowerPoint. My first PowerPoint slide. I've got the wrong mouse. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes, outstanding. Okay, so <clears throat> in a paper published in 2013 as part of an exchange with Roth, Frank Angerschmidt writes, the three philosophers serving Roth as his main guide are successively one, Quine, two, Quine, and three, Quine. And I consider it highly unlikely that Roth would ever seriously consider for more than a moment a philosophical position ir irreconcilable with anything Quine has ever said. Now, no one will dispute that Quine was one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, arguable, but <laughs> the difficulty is rather that Quine never spoke about the writing of history and regarded the discipline with distrust, if not outright contempt. Self-evidently, this must have its consequences for anyone taking Quine as his or her guide for unraveling the secrets of writing history. Um, and I think, and, you know, Anker Schmidt's work is problematic in its own way, but here I think he's bang on the money. Um, and so the reason I've kind of, and, and I mean, they've sort of kissed and made up, I think um, Anker Schmidt reviewed his most recent book in uh, history and theory and was quite positive. But um, in order to understand how Roth ends up on the path towards realism, you have to understand Quine and in particular Quine's rejection of meaning and his linguistic behaviorism. Indeed, I will argue that this is, in fact, the glue which holds together um, Roth's uh, most of the parts of Roth's uh, irrealist view of history. <clears throat> so, ah, damn good coffee and hot. So one of the key planks, of course, of Quine's um, thesis for the indeterminacy of translation was, is in, is, was that in order for there to be such things as a determinate translation, uh, there would need to be meanings, determinate meanings, which could be captured. And this, of course, is precisely what Quine rejects. There are, you know, I mean, there are mental entities such as meanings, but there is no sort of determinate meaning. And hence, Quine opted for a sort of a linguistic behaviorism. Now, Behaviorism is a tricky term to pin down because there are as many variants of behaviorism as there are toes on your feet. But um, as a rough approximation of it, we can say that most forms of it reject any reference to hypothetical inner states of organisms as causes for their behavior. OK, there we go. So a couple of quotes from Quine. Uh, Quine defended his behaviorism as the insistence upon crouching all criteria uh, in observational terms. By observation terms, I mean terms that are or can be taught by extension, and whose application in each particular case, therefore, can be checked intersubjectively. Not to cavil over the word behaviorism, perhaps current usage would be best suited by referring to this orientation to observation simply as empiricism, but it is empiricism in a distinctly modern sense, for it rejects the naive mentalism that typified the old empiricism. <clears throat> and in one of his last works, he stated that in psychology, one may or not may be a behaviorist, but in linguistics, one has no choice. As long as our command of our language fits all external checkpoints, where our utterance or our reaction to someone's utterance can be appraised in the light of some shared situation, all is well. Our mental life between checkpoints is indifferent to our rating as a master of the language. There is nothing in linguistic meaning beyond what is to be gleaned from overt behavior, overt, overt behavior even, in certain circumstances. So it's important to note then that this is an ontological claim, right? Not an epistemological one. As Eve, Eve Gorday puts it in our book on Quine, 
uh, puts it. We have data for translation, but no entities. Translations are based on observation of verbal behavior in observable circumstances and not on the reference to a denominator, an entity, the proposition or the meaning that the sentences of the translator's language and the sentences of the native's language would have in common. Translations are not based on the identification of entities, brackets, meanings about which translations would be right or wrong. In other words, there is meaning, but no meanings. So I think we're starting to get a sense of why Roth, at least so far as history is concerned. Pause, glug. Uh, should feel an affinity with Goodman's notion of irrealism. Uh, one suspects that Quine and transitively Roth would be horrified at any attempt to endorse the notion, the, the Goodmanian notion of world making, so far as the domain of science and particularly physics is concerned. But as far as history and indeed the social sciences in general are concerned, world making is fair game and in play because the bread and butter of history is, in a nutshell, the attempt to recover past intentions. What was individual X or Y thinking that led them to perform action Z? And of course, on Quine's view, meaning is nothing more than what, be can, gleaned, what can be gleaned from overt behavior in observable circumstances. In Quine's words, a language is mastered through social emulation and social feedback. And these controls ignore any idiosyncrasy in an individual's mastery or associations that is not discovered in his behavior. And as Roth makes the point in his essay, Worlds of Passmaking, to jump ahead slightly. Oh, I ain't gonna get it done. There we go. <clears throat> One needs to give evidence in the usual cases for ascribing intentions, but evidence here consists of further descriptions of circumstances and behaviors. We do not, italics, advert to behavior for lack of being able to look inside the head, rather, Actions described in certain ways just is what intentional action is, and correct attributions are the ones that accord with the habits of projecting intentional predicates within the community at a given time, but nothing makes these descriptions or these communities determinative of what really happened. No thing makes behavior intentional or not. Communities possess no privileged access with regard to ascribing intentions. So I think you can argue that pretty much everything, with the exception maybe of, of Danto's narrative sentences stuff, that falls into, that falls out of Rossi realism, uh, can be said to track from this base. So, for example, Leon Goldstein's um, historiographical idealism. On Goldstein's view, historians start from an undifferentiated mass of evidence and the very process of designating it as evidence for such and such an event involves a strong form of conceptualization. Evidence has no, evi uh, has no essence, as it were, but only becomes evidence for something by being classified as such by the historian. And of course, the upshot of all this is that the historians constitute the facts they ultimately explain. Different accounts, different facts. Now, I mean, this would be, you know, on the face of it, idealism of the the worst kind. And indeed, Goldstein apparently used to be quite irritated by being referred to as an idealist, which is a bit like the Pope, the Pope being annoyed at being referred to uh, as a Catholic. But on Quinean behaviorism, Goldstein's historiographical uh, abduction becomes perfectly respectable. For on Roth's view, the attribution of the character of a piece of historical evidence requires the attribution of actions and events which would account for it. In order to categorize it, we need to see it as instantiating a kind of action or event, which in turn, presumably, turns on the intentions of the actors involved. But of course, on the Roth-Quine view, there is no fact of the matter which can decide between incompatible attributions of meaning. So now we come to the notion of action under a description. Um, on Roth's view, which he derives from hacking, and I derive from this PowerPoint slide. Yes, we're on the right side, excellent. Mental, mental state terms such as intend and all its cognates and indeed related propositional attitudes do not refer to something fixed or determinate in the mind. I think those are my italics, by the way. 
If the concern is to understand how people communicate, aversion to processes in the head looks the wrong way. Rather, the Anscom, Anscom hacking point emphasizes that what intentionality comes to is a socially sanctioned way of describing what we or others sometimes do, how we characterize certain behaviors. So in other words, if behavior can be characterized in a certain way and we're not allowed to appeal to the, to the putative cause of an action, i.e. the intentions that an agent had when undertaking it, then action and the description of that action really do collapse together. And hence the whole thing of new descriptions becoming available really does change the past, not through any kind of retroactive causation because that the actions themselves were indeterminate in a sense, insofar as they are amenable to being captured under different descriptions. There can be no such thing as the description of an action only various ways of conceptualizing a bit of behavior. Um, time's ticking on, right? So I'm going to sort of move to the um, to the meat of the of the argument. But I mean, we could go on here. For instance, um, you know, Roth goes on to talk about the role that you know practices and feedback pay plays, um, and this, of course, is all you know again can be traced back to the sort of the Quinean idea that you know meanings are fluid and context dependent shaped by the web of language and the practices of its users rather than being fixed isolated entities blah 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 all that good stuff um okay so that's a fair amount of exposition then but i think it's important as i said not only to sort of untangle the various strands of roth's argument but also to kind of get a grip on where the base is i now want to talk about what I think are some of the problems with it. I mean, I think to be honest that to invoke irrealism in any contest is a bit of an iffy move. Um, as we saw, irrealism, or, or as I uh, delineated, I should say, irrealism is predicated on the idea that there are no such things as inherent properties in objects. Um, kind groupings are based on similarity, where similarity is sharing a property, any property. So on Goodman's argument, that makes any two things similar, since where one object is an F and another is a G, each has the property of being F or G. Of course, we tend to focus on some dimensions of similarity rather than others, but that's just a fact about us. There is nothing special, objectively special, about those dimensions upon which we focus. In other words, every grouping of object is just as good, objectively speaking, uh, as every other. No objects go together because of the nature of things. So if all groupings are equally good, then the world is simply an amorphous collection of objects. Any linguistic community is free to choose any groupings they like for their predicates, describe their surroundings in those terms, and formulate laws of nature using those groupings. Providing they say true things in the resulting language, they succeed as inquirers just as well as any other linguistic community. We can describe the world of color using you know, predicates such as blue and green, but we would lose nothing beyond familiarity and convenience by shifting to a language of Gru and Baleen. The problem is that this is just largely unbelievable. Um, as Theodore Sider puts it, it is true our talk of similarity is pretty flexible. In the right context, we are apt to count the sharing of nearly any property as a similarity. You know, you can count people as similar based on looks, the size of their bank accounts or the voting districts in which they live. But it's hard to believe that 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 is all there is to it. And indeed, as I've said, you know, it's hard to believe that, you know, when it comes to physics, you know, Roth would be inclined to accept such a view. So the crux of Roth's irrealism then must lie in the demarcation between the natural sciences and the social sciences, that there is such a difference between them is, I think, uh, indisputable. But it's precisely where Roth draws the line that sets the stage for his um, irrealism. At one point um, you know, in his work, Roth remarks that hacking stresses that a hallmark of humanistic thought just is that it lacks the features which make for stable scientific knowledge. Now, this, of course, leads us to the issue of standardization, um, because for Roth, one of the things that demarcates historical knowledge from that of the natural sciences is there exist no standardized descriptions of events in the same way that there are uh, standardized descriptions in the sciences. Um, I've got a couple of quotes here from um, 
Roth book. Uh, nothing answers to normal history uh, because there exists no theory that normalizes historical events. There is no settled theoretical recipe in historiography regarding how facts should or could be put together to make an event and which events they make. So, Roth claims to know of no theoretical recipe upon which facts can be put together to make an event. I do. Marxism. Granted, it's not a very good recipe, but it is a recipe. Secondly, the notion, the very notion of facts being put together to form events is, you know, we don't have time to go into the metaphysics of events here. Um, sorry, a pop-up's just uh, come up on my screen. Um, and now I can't see anyone, which is a bit of a blow. Can you all see that? <laughs> okay. Um, stop share. Okay. <clears throat> so suffice to say that while facts report events, you don't put facts together to make an event. You do we see whether you can apply the appropriate sort of concept to the, you know, the temporal perdurant in question. Be that as it may. With regards to standardization or the supposed lack thereof, um, I mean, I would argue that there is a fairly standard conception of the events and actions that form large scale events and processes like, you know, the First World War, the Industrial Revolution and so on. And furthermore, that if we want an example of what normal history would look like, we can just look at any historical journal. The kind of specialized small scale studies that populate these journals are made largely possible by the fact that, you know, the fundamentals of what happened in most cases have largely been settled. Um, you don't see any, you know, journal articles entitled, did a war break out on the Austro-Serbian border in 1914, for example. Uh, such a question is, all, you know, we're, we're quite happy that such a thing already occurred. Moreover, the types of kinds or sortal terms, if you like, that historians use, war, revolution, so on, while not having the precision of scientific terms, are good enough to be able to individuate things like wars, revolutions, and so on, which is presumably all that we want them to do. <clears throat> I suspect the line of thought behind this argument for standardization, and indeed much idealist thought about historical theory, um, seems to run along the following lines. If the past were truly able to constrain historical accounts, then historians would be able to alight upon a single shared uh, agreed account of a given episode of the past, uh, evidential lacuna notwithstanding. The fact that historians continue to d disagree about certain aspects of the past, and indeed have in some cases written radically different accounts based on the same evidence, I mean the, the French Revolution is the, the poster child here, is what leads to skepticism about historical knowledge. Most such accounts, however, are based on epistemological considerations, um, you know, the underdetermination of theory by evidence. Roth, however, as we've seen, seeks to take an ontological approach. On this view, standardization is in principle impossible because historical, historiographical kinds even, lack the kind of theoretical stability that natural kinds do by virtue of their very nature or lack thereof. So the point is then that, you know, it's a realism and not idealism because we are not creating, uh, we are not constituting historical accounts in lieu of any kind of epistemological access to the past a la Goldstein. But even if we were able to sort of perceptually access the past or whatever, there would be no ready-made past in any case, right? We have to constitute it. We have no choice. So here are my worries, or at least a couple of them. Um, the first is I worry about using sort of any sort of behaviorism of a cornerstone of any kind of philosophy in 2024. Um, you know, behaviorism in the sort of the cognitive sciences, is, sciences and particularly the philosophy of mind um, is largely seen as being a, a dead letter, having been eclipsed by the sort of the cognitive revolution in the second half of the 20th century, which inaugurated or re-inaugurated, you could argue, um, you know, a representational theory of mind. At the center of all this was the idea that mental events and entities such as beliefs and representations, which of course behaviorism rejected on the grounds that they were not observable, observable, 
played a key role in things like language learning, behavior, and various cognitive processes. Now, of course, the, no, the exact notion and form that these uh, mental representations take, um, you know, are still themselves debated. But um, if mental processes are back on the table, then, you know, irrealism simply becomes idealism. There are also some problems, and I mean, these can be traced back to Hacking's work, which sort of sort of trans transitively applied to Roth's view of uh, actions and description. And these center on the cluster uh, cluster around the concept of concept possession, no pun intended, the notion of concept possession. So, I mean, Hacking's work on the project projection of contemporary kinds back into the past started with medical, con well, psychiatric concepts, for example, you know, although the category of schizophrenia uh, postdates Socrates by several centuries, you know, can we legitimately say that he was a schizophrenic? And you know, this debate moves on to sort of concepts in general. For example, a guy in the 1920s uh, gropes a woman, uh, pinches her backside, hassles her for a date. Clearly, we would now say that this is sexual harassment. But given that in the 1920s, the concept of sexual harassment did not exist, um, how could the uh, man in question have intentionally accept, in, intentionally uh, intended to sexually harass the woman in question, given that the concept did not exist? I should have bought uh, two cups of coffee up. I made an error in judgment. The answer that most of us would uh, plump for, I think, is that by our standards, this is clearly an act of sexual harassment, but by the standards operative of the time, it was not and could not have been. So this in turn seems to call for what we might call the integrity of past thinking and past concepts. And this is where attention starts to emerge in Roth's position. On one hand, Roth at certain points seems committed to the idea that you know past modes of thought can and should be captured uh, intact. So you know witnesses approving mark remarks on uh, Thomas Kuhn's arguments to the effect that past science has to be taken uh, on its own terms. You know we have to avoid uh, Whiggism, as Kuhn would put it. But this seems to be at odds with the irrealist notion that there is a you know, there is no privileged description of the past. Indeed, the very notion of describing and re-describing a past event is at odds with the, the Goldstein view that the past is constituted. Now, Roth is, uh, agrees with Goldstein that historians constitute a past as opposed to finding things out about a pre-existing past. Uh, some categories used to constitute the past, including especially human actions, possess nothing that intrinsically stabilizes them. In this regard, past actions may change because intentional kinds have no stability or essence beyond the contingencies of community sanctioned descriptions used to characterize them. But strictly speaking, redescription is impossible on the constitution view, as the actions are brought into being by the very act of description. To redescribe something presumes that there is an it to be described and redescribed. But if we are constituting the very facts that we are to explain, then it makes no sense to talk about the same action being redescribed. On a strict irrealist reading, we have two different descriptions of two different actions. Now, clearly, this is not what hacking had in mind. Um, one of the you know, one of the, the example we talked about, you know, can a piece of behavior at time S be described as you know, sexual harassment, given that the concept postdates the time of the action? To pose such a question presupposes that one and the same action can be described in different manners. Indeed, this was the whole point of um, Elizabeth Ankham's original argument. One action can be subsumed under many non-contradictory descriptions, some of which make it intentional and some not. What Anscombe made very clear, however, that it was the same action that it was at issue. You know, that while there is no kind of, you know, there's no such thing as the description uh, of a given action, what we are describing is one and the same action, but picking it out with different descriptions. Now, the cases that Hacking and Roth both tend to focus on are those which it is either, you know, it either is or maybe the case that the candidate descriptions drawn from different conceptual schemes are at odds with one another. 
you know, but you can't have your cake and eat it here. Remember, on Goodman's view, different descriptions correspond to different worlds. You either have to abandon adherence to a stricter realism then and allow for the possibility that the same action can be redescribed in different ways, uh, or you give up on the notion of redescription and state that different actions are constituted as part of different pasts. You can't be a little bit pregnant, right? And you can't be a little bit irrealist. Um, yeah, it has to be swallowed whole or not at all, um, <laughs> as the actress said to the bishop. If different, if different versions correspond to different worlds, then the integrity of past science goes with it. So how are we doing for time? Uh, OK, I think I've spoken long enough. OK, conclusion. So in some senses, irrealism finds itself you know, a natural home in historical theory. Insofar as philosophy of history has always been something of a sort of a, a salon privé for ideas that are seen as a, a, a bit disreputable um, in mainstream philosophy. Um, for instance, you know, Goodman's realism tends to be sort of spoken of now as, you know, and he also did this. I mean, he's largely remembered for uh, his work on set theory, uh, the work on induction and his philosophy of aesthetics. It's no coincidence, I think, that in the... Um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy argument on Goodman, um, irrealism is relegated to the sort of the last two paragraphs um, of the piece. Uh, but now it seems to have sort of made its way to historical um, theory, where, as I say, you know, the classic example here is Hayden White. Um, philosophers of literature have generally been none too impressed with uh, White's arguments, but of course in historical theory, he's seen as one of the great thinkers. Um, to finish then with the idea of the Heath Robinson contraption, then, you know, if you're convinced by Quine's linguistic behaviorism, and if you're happy with Goldstein's historical constitutionalism, and if you're okay with Hacking's dynamic nominalism, if all this comes off, then Roth's surrealism works as a theory of historical explanation. Um, unfortunately, I think it doesn't, and therefore it's, uh, you know, goes back in the box with the rest of the broken toys. And that's me done. All right. Uh, thank you, Adam. Cut. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, not yet. We're not done. We're not finished yet. Um, oh, no, no. We've got uh, questions. But, uh... <laughs> okay. Now, as I said, before we have the discussion session, is there immediately somebody who would like to... Uh, sorry. Can we just take a, a two-minute break so I can refill my cup? Uh, is that Okay. If 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 you really need to, yes. But uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, my yeah, my throat is very dry. Literally, give me sixty seconds, then I'll okay, be okay. Sorry, then... I'd, I'd assume there was going to be a, a short gap between the discussion. Okay, bear with me. All right. Well, then people can still think about good questions or comments or criticisms. Let me well. And we're back, as the, right. uh, so, the Jimmy, was, J Jimmy Fallon character used to say on Saturday Night Live. That was that was fast. Um, okay. Uh, again, is there any uh, question, comments, concerned immediately? Yes, I think Eugen, right? Was yes. a hand. Yes, yeah, please. It's me. Yeah. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, so. Maybe I would have one comment. So I don't see why you read Roth so much ontologically. Uh, you sometimes in your talk, occasionally you emphasize this aspect, but I see I, I tend to read him more epistemologically. And even if you look at, I understand that if you uh, focus on his ways of past making yeah. or the past, maybe it may look like he's discussing uh, ontology. But if you bear in mind like what he wrote in his book, so I think it's clear he's more interested into historical knowledge. But my kind of question to you is probably, so at the end, 
uh, you mentioned that Rob combines a lot of things like Goodman's stuff, something from hacking, something from uh, Quine, behaviorism. And you kind of your argument seemed to be, oh, but I don't like it. But it seems to me that if you want to undermine what Rod is saying, and if it really is the case that it's a building made out of Quine's behaviorism, Goldman's, uh, sorry, Goodman's something, Goldstein, other thing, you need to undermine all these small planks. And I didn't hear any, any criticism or any arguments pointing at behaviorism. You know, I heard something like there is a cognitive turn now, but that's not an argument. That's just a statement. Okay, that's my question. Okay. Um, so first, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't like it. But <laughs> you know, I'm not going to deny that. But with regard, I'll take you take your first point first. So the problem is, is that if it focuses on, if we construe this epistemolo epistemologically, then it's not a realism, right? The whole point of irrealism is this is supposed to be a third way between realism and anti-realism. If we construe it epistemolo uh, epistemologically, easy for me to say, um, then it just becomes good old-fashioned anti-realism, right? The the whole base of this is that it's a realism because the, the entities that we're trying to recapture on Ross view simply have no concrete existence outside of our representation. So if it was anti-realism, it'd just be, well, we're trying to recapture these, these meanings and stuff, but it's awfully problematic. Um, you know, and it sort of it'd be hard to differentiate it from sort of Leon Goldstein's view. Um, so to me, the the ontological interpretation is an essential role because if we take that away, then you know what makes it irrealism as opposed to anti-realism. Yeah. The... Yes. Is there a media short follow up? Otherwise, there's another question. Uh, if there was. No. Sorry. Okay. Can I can I respond to the second part? Oh, sorry. 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 Forty. But no, I, I was just just waiting to see if Eugene wanted to to pop back in. But it's fair enough. If yeah. I can just make a comment. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. Uh, so I I would have to check it. But I. Okay. Maybe it's a mistake of Paul. Why he uses the, this term irrealism? I think there is you know, nothing substantial hanging on this term. He uses it maybe, you know, one time in one paper, maybe two times in his book. It's, uh, you know, I would call his view anti-representationalism or non-representationalism. That's, that's how I read him. But I, you know, I understand what you mean. Okay. Well, I mean, I would disagree with that insofar as, you know, why is it there? You know, he's, he's very, he makes a point to cite this stuff, right? It didn't, you know, didn't just, drop out of a helicopter, as, as Jim Hurd would say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if he wants to ditch your realism, um, that's fine. Um, but then in that case, it, it becomes good old fashioned anti-realism. With regards to the second point you made, I mean, I think all the planks are problematic. Um, but, you know, there's only so much uh, ground you can cover in a in a 45 minute talk. So, um, yeah, I'd be happy to write 30,000 words on the issues with Goldstein. Um, I mean, I, I tended to focus on the, the stuff about um, actions and a description. I mean, that's just one plank. But but the point I well was trying to make apparently didn't do very well, but is that, you know, all these elements are problematic. It's not just that, you know, we're, we're using lots of different things here is that, you know, they're all each in their own way, um, you know, a bit iffy. And so when you're, you know, the, the foundations are wobbly, then the whole must necessarily collapse. All right. Uh, I think we can take it up again if there's time again, if you want later on, guys. But first, um, yeah, sure. there is uh, Jack Morgan had a question, <laughs> I think. At least they were raising their hand. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. I'm trying to get my, my camera to work. Let me see. Is that okay? Can you see me now? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not um, misquoting you or, or, or maybe I missed it, but it seems like you said at one point when you're talking about Roth's um, non-standardization thesis that Roth thinks that it's in principle impossible to have a standard description. Um, no, I, I, it... well, I, I think that on that you have to read it. Uh, so I don't think he actually says anywhere, but I think if you follow the logic of his argument, it has to be, you know, because otherwise, because this is what's driving the distinction between the natural and the human sciences, right? So yes, I did say that, but that was my uh, yeah. interpolation as it were 
Yeah, I suppose that, that that's not my under, under, understanding. I think it's um, it's you know you, you you start with the resources that historians have, and I see the Roth's work m m mostly indebted to Danto in this regard, right? So we have narrative sentences. This is a logic distinctive of um, the, the histories that we that we read. And so, although it's in principle possible, I think Roth would say that look, maybe one day there'll be a community of um, epistemic agents interested in the past and much like I suppose some economic histories try to do they'll try and use a standard unit of analysis in order to understand that domain nonetheless look as a committed naturalist trying to understand um, how this how these communities of, of epistemic agents work it just is the case that we use um, non-standard descriptions uh, I think I, I took it to be not, not a, in other words an a priori argument that it is impossible but just it just is the case that this is how this knowledge uh, system works but if it's the case that in principle we could reach such a description then surely everything else particularly in the later work right you have the three the three no's right what is it non non detachability non standardization and uh, what's the third one non aggregativity surely that all collapses right well we can i can think... read yeah sorry go on. I don't. I don't think they they're, they're all mutually dependent. I think that non that non aggregative thesis stands on its own, and then the non detachability thesis falls out of non standardization. So they are interlinked then. Well, non detachability. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, I think that one. Uh, you know, to to me, or at least on my um, on my reading of Roth's work, you know that. The very notion of non-standardization has to do some heavy lifting there, I think, for Roth, because I think, and particularly in ways of past making, you know, that that seems to be the hinge upon which the distinction is made between the natural and the social sciences. Um, and I think he probably takes that from uh, Kuhn, you know, who also, um, you know, thought that. But uh, yeah, that's my that's my response. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, both of you. Um, anybody else for the moment? Um, well, I, I have a short question. I, I sort of interject. You can, make, you, can make, you can make it a long one if there's nobody else. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I had uh, maybe I have some more, but I need to think about it a bit more. So I interject it just here and give the rest of the people some time to think about it. Um, I would like to ask you sort of, you didn't make this a topic today. Um, but since you're very critical of Roth's irrealism, maybe it's an anti-realism, let's, let's take that for granted at the moment. As, okay, as, as, I'm as, that I'm critical of it. No, yeah, that, that, that <laughs> the position has some problems that you're critical oh, okay. of it too. Yes. Um, what sort of um, realism uh, would you then sort of um, put forth as a, as, as a better alternative? I understand that you come from, that your understanding is that sort of, Histori philosophy of historiography has too long and been non-realist, maybe what you call idealist and so forth. Um, so my question then is sort of, um, is it, is it um, a thing of sort of, we need to get into what can be called historiographic realism, sort of we need to find out to what extent the realist interpretation of historiography is reasonable given the practice of historiography and what historiography is doing. Or is it a sort of more general realism? And um, what are we exactly realist about then? Are we, um, well, because we can ask what we are realist about by um, scrutinizing historiography. Historians debate in a certain way. So they agree on certain facts. They might agree on some other stuff. Therefore, we, if they do it well, we can be realist about that. That would be one way. So I guess maybe the question is, 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 is a double question. Um, <clears throat> what, what, what sort of realism do you propose instead of Roth's irrealism? And in what way are we trying to answer questions of realism? Maybe the second question is of a metaphilosophical question. Is the way we understand, we, we argue about realism via the practice of historiography, then it would be historiographic realism. Or is it some more general uh, discussion about realism? And if it's a more general discussion about realism, how do we um, animate the, the conclusions we make or the arguments? So I think, um... So I, I guess what's kind of at the root of my historiographical reason, realism is that, um, and I mean, I talk about this in the book, obviously, but, you know, you, 
you generally have two sort of two scores, right? You have the the anti-realists are all philosophers, right? Um, or generally, and the realists are all historians. And the problem with the the sort of um, the historians realist is that they're um, you know either a sort of a, a naive empiricism or they're sort of more descriptions of epistemology, right? And I mean, it's one of the the interesting things I think that. Um, I think both Roth and Goldstein, each in their own way, sort of says that, well, you know, this kind of all this falls out of an examination of the practice of history. Right. So, uh, you know, I think at one point Roth specifically states, you know, nothing I have said is designed to impinge on sort of historical practice. Right. And that implies that kind of, you know, that historical theory then is sort of a cherry on the top. Right. You know, so, you know, you historians get on, you know, we'll do the philosophizing, you historians, you know, you just get on with it and so forth. Um, but as I say, I think the roots of my historiographical realism is that the the kind of the, the arguments that were put forth for historiographical anti-realism, the philosophical arguments were all found wanting to some extent, right? The idea that, you know, we we can't refer to the past, that, um, that you know, our access is problematic, that linguistic forms, you know, necessarily distort um, what we write about it and so forth. And, and I just didn't think that any of those those arguments held water. Um, I don't think that in order to be a, a sort of a, a realist, you have to sort of subscribe to the, um, you know, the Lord Acton, you know, ultimate history um, sort of thing. But put it this way, I've yet to see an argument for historical anti-realism, which has sort of made me thought, yeah, OK, you know, we can't. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are epistemological limitations, of course, in terms of evidence and stuff that that comes down to us. But, you know, conceptually, um you know, the, the arguments that have been put forth, you know, with regards to our access to the past. And I mean, it's interesting that the kind of scepticism about access to the past that you see in historical theory is not really reproduced in analytic philosophy elsewhere, right? So if you look at things like the, um, the arguments about the causal theory of reference, you know, we have people there, you know, talking about how we can refer to Socrates, you know, unproblematically. Yeah, the, the sort of extreme scepticism only seems to come up in um, historical theory for whatever reason. Did, did that sort of answer it or did you? Uh, probably, perhaps. I need to think about it a bit more, um, but <laughs> okay. I, I, I want to give other people the chance. I would have one short follow up on this. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, let me just truly put oh, it okay. on the, I, I, let me put the follow up no, and then no. just Josie, I think, but just a short follow up because I'm the moderator here mostly. I should be. Um, would you then agree that historiographic realism is identified, whether um, historiography is sort of, whether realism is good interpretation of the <laughs> practice that we see in historiography, is a question more than anything else of justification, of an epistemic question of, of, of whether there's enough evidence and so forth on the practice as, of historiography, not a question about metaphysics. Um, because that, would help us to find some common ground between different theories. Because whether or not you're a realist or anti-realist, <clears throat> I know very little people in the philosophy of history, historiography, maybe historical theory, theory of history, who would uh, disagree that historiography produces some knowledge of the past, however limited, very, very atomic propositions and so forth. And that can be justified by the methods that historiography is using for producing that knowledge of the past. So if we agree that realism is a question of how far justification gets us via the evidence and theories and so forth, then you might have a common ground between a lot of theories and then you don't need to polemicize or antagonize other people very strongly and you might be able even to... to <laughs> is, is, that, is that what I've been doing then? No, maybe not you, anybody. <laughs> also, I, I think there's a lot of polemics on both sides. And then you might even be able to, to form a common research program which somehow wants to understand how far the scientific pr practice of, of historiography reach. Because then we have colligations, we have all kinds of complicated descriptions and semantics and so forth, and it's unclear to what extent. Would you say this is a common ground that could be <laughs> began with? Possibly, but then there's also the question of, um, I, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical of the idea that you can prize metaphysics and epistemology apart so easily. Um, you, you know, maybe you can argue that they're two sides of the, of the same coin, but... Um, yeah, I'm sure that, that you know there's always common ground, but um, you know, yeah, I suppose <laughs> is the short answer to your question. <clears throat> All right, I like that answer anyway. But I think it's Josie, right, or uh, who is, has a question or a comment? 
Yeah, I, I see a hand. Okay. Yes, yes. hello. Uh, I, I don't know. If, can you hear me? Uh, not not very well. I was going to say, yeah, it's a bit faint. Maybe so. you turn off your camera. Turn, maybe try turning off your camera. Maybe it's, I think it's a bandwidth issue. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that's better. <clears throat> Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, okay. So, um, thinking a lot a little bit, but um, so I think that it's right that there is a distinction between um, semantic nihilism. I think Quine is often described as a kind of semantic nihilist rather than a sort of skeptic. So it's not as if he thinks that we, um, you know, there is a correct translation, but we cannot get to it. He just thinks that there is no such thing as the correct translation because he doesn't think that there are any meanings. So if Roth follows Quine um, closely in that way, then I suppose he is um, like Quine, a um, you know a nihilist about, and, uh, rather than a kind of um, skeptic in that sense. So his 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 point is an ontological one and not um, and not an epistemic one. I would say though that you know because you have mentioned a lot of double standards. Uh, I think that there is a big double standard that is often made, which is to say, you know, a lot of people writing in the philosophy of history have been um, sort of, you know, told off for being postmodernist. But Quine is never being told off for being a postmodernist. You know, it's like because he's an analytic philosopher, you know, that sort of criticism is not really leveled against him. So I think. Uh, you know that there is a bit of an imbalance there in the way in which these philosophers are, are are treated. But the question that I wanted to ask is is this. So um I think um I think you were saying that um so I suppose it's it's a follow-up a little bit on uh on on Gergen in terms of where it is that you you want to go with this because I think uh Quine um identifies uh, meanings with um, mental items, with psychological items, and he wants to say that the, that that there are no such things. Now, uh, if you want a realism, are you going to say that then that to get to the to these meanings uh, requires um, um, recuperating or somehow get to this kind of um, inner psychological items? Um, that we somewhat can get to them because I mean there is, there was an interpretation you know a debate within <clears throat> hermeneutics as to whether you know one could uh, you know one should recuperate authorial intentions uh, or, or whether you know on the other hand you know we should um, uh, you know what we can do is reinterpret it from the perspective of um, of, of 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 the reader and uh, it seems to me that uh, I mean I, while I um uh, I am not a fan of of uh Quine's radical interpretation. Um I would not actually want to say, I would not want to say that actually um trying to get to this past requires somehow getting into the heads, you know, to be a realist would require somewhat uh going back to recuperating the notions of some kind of hidden authorial intention. Um, so I just wonder where, you know, so if you're criticizing Quine on this and, and saying, well, you know, there is a past that, um, you know, we can get to. Um, and I think you were speaking about actions and intentions. Uh, then do you think, you know, so would a realist on your view be able to um, to recuperate these intentions? Um, is that how, is that what you, you would want to say? Okay, um, so I think there's three points I want to address there. So let me take those in order. For first, um, I agree. That, well, actually, with what you say about Quine, in that you know it's always, uh, and as you say, he's kind of, you know, I've always wondered how someone who propounded what was it the, you know, inscrutability of reference, indeterminacy, indeterminacy of translation, and ontological relativism is can somehow be described as a as a scientific realist, and yet of course that is exactly <laughs> what you know. Brian tends to be described as. Um, there are people who have taken issue. I know Branko Mitrovic um, would, uh, would would agree with me on that. 
in terms of the way that Roth follows Quine, I mean, I would argue that there is a um, slight departure here, and thank you for bringing this up because it's an interesting point, is that Quine would arguably be sort of agnostic about the the exist, you know, could could I mean, you know, skeptic, agnostic, but well, you know, Roth very clearly on at least one occasion. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the paper. It's um, it's in the Dale Jaquette book on Quine. Um, you know, Roth very clearly states, you know, what could possibly act as a truth maker for descriptions of meaning. So it may well be that Roth takes a more sort of hardline, quite a uh, hardline view on that position um, than Quine does. So uh, to come back to, to the third and the final question, does this mean that we, you know, are is the historiographical realist committed to trying to recover past intentions? Is that fair to is that fair to summarize it? Yeah, that's right because yeah. that's the example that 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 you use. So if if uh, to be a realist means to think that meanings are psychological items in in the head, and Quine is skeptical about that, well, that, does that entail that being a realist? entails committing oneself to the view that meaning are psychological items in the head and that one can know them. I think it entails, you know, that that they are psychological items in the head and whether we can know them is perhaps still an open question. But I mean, uh, I know I was accused of hand waving a little bit earlier when I talked about the, the stuff that's happened in the, you know, cognitive revolution. But given that you know, all the work that we've had on, you know, sort of things like concept formation and, uh, you know, Eleanor Roche and, you know, Susan Carey, the origins of concept. Um, you know, the the idea that there are mental entities that play a key role, um, you know, in our, in our lives is, you know, well, to me, I think it's fairly, um, it's a given at this point. Is it the job of the historian to capture them? Yes, I guess I think it is. And I mean, to, to take an example from um, the, the other stuff I'm doing on um, Thomas Kuhn, right? So um, obviously Kuhn wrote a, a monograph on um, black body theory or, you know, the discovery of Planck's um, black body radiation law. And the sort of the key question that the debates in that field have turned around is that, you know, did Planck realize the revolutionary import of his black body radiation law. Did he think he'd done, done something revolutionary or did he think that, you know, actually he was still operating within the, the confines of what we would now call classical physics? Um, and, and, and it seems that, you know, certainly historians in that field, uh, that Thomas Kuhn certainly did, um, you know, if, to use Kuhn's uh, phrase, although I don't know if I'll quite put it as Kuhn, I think is very uh, strongly in favour of the idea that we can sort of, um, recover these mental entities, as he put it in one paper, you know, that I was very good at climbing into the heads of other people and um, and, and seeing what I could get. So um, I would argue a uh, yes, <laughs> I guess. If you want a yes or no answer to your third question, yes. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's because, you know, when, when uh, some philosophers um, were ascribed that view, um, then, you know, they were accused of uh, somewhat um, assuming that they could have a hotline to people's minds, that they had some kind of telepathic powers of access. So clearly we can make a distinction between, you know, sometimes what, you know, we might say um, the intended meanings and perhaps, you know, the received meanings, but Somehow making that distinction, it seems to me, kind of mean that we can get into their head. It means that we must be able to make the distinction somehow by um, in, in a way that does not require us to um, access the contents of, 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 of their heads. So, um, so I'm a bit concerned that you know, you can reject Quine, and I, you know, I, I am no fan. I think I, I do. I would like to say that, um, that there is a certain integrity that the text of the past has, uh, when we read it, perhaps in its historical context. Um, but I, I think that trying to recuperate that that integrity, um, I don't know whether you know one might call it an original meaning as opposed to a retrospective meaning. Uh, 
I, I would be very skeptical of any suggestion that that coincides with some kind of psychological item and that we we can kind of get to it like that i'm i'm um <clears throat> so i guess i think that the realism uh, about authorial intention if if it's if it's construed psychologically is suspicious um so to that extent you know maybe um so can, can i ask I, a question yeah yeah. So, 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 where does the so what's where does the integrity come from then? What is the so you know? Well, I suppose about... there is a difference between reading Shakespeare in its context and reading it in our context. So, you know, there are some, uh, I suppose, um, some uh, directors who decide to modernize Shakespeare. <laughs> In such a way that you know it's it's you know they transform his plays in such a way that um, it's not that like they capture some kind of core meanings that um, that is universal, <laughs> but they they almost you know they 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 read it in our in 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 by our own lights by our own concepts by our own ca categories. So I think that there is a legitimate way in which we can recuperate an original meaning. Uh, by you know uh, understanding the ways in which people would have read Shakespeare at the time, what is it that you know what he said would have meant to people at the time, but I don't think that that is the same as somewhat um, discovering some kind of inner psychological. But this is a this is a literary process. text, though, right? So, yeah. so I would so I would argue that you know this is this is apples and oranges, right? You know, um, a work of you know literature or fiction, um, presumably, does not possess the same communicative intention as a piece of writing that's meant to be taken literally. Is that is that unfair? I think uh, we probably have the same interpretative problem, isn't it? Because in a way, people use language in, uh, you know, language is intersubjectively valid. People understood certain things by certain words. Um, and I don't see how else we can do that other than by, um, you know, gaining entrance to people's minds via, you know, <laughs> via the way in which we're spoken and, and those sort of publicly uh understood meanings okay so this is sort of a, a general hermeneutic uh problem in general is that well no it's just that uh, it, it, oh, oh, no, no, i'm not trying to argue i'm just you know clar clarify yeah well i suppose i was asking do you want to be a realist about meanings and and uh you know and i just wonder what does it mean to be a realist about 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 meanings um, you know, what does it mean to, you know, to recuperate the original intention? That's that was my question. Okay. So, so in a way, I was mm. trying to ask you, where is it that what is your positive story? So, let's say that we reject Quine because and and Roth to the extent that he follows Quine, and that one wants to say that there is determinacy in translation, that to some extent, you know, that that there is you know some kind of meaning that is fixed. But then there is the question: What fixes it? I agree, but it, it seems that we, you know we're either, we're either trying to capture something or we are right. So if we're saying that people have you know intention had a certain intention, um, and I mean, uh, no, I was going to use an example about colligation and and the Holocaust, but I'm not going to because it's a my it's a minefield and it's you know we haven't got time. Um, but um, if we can be said to be trying to capture that then there has to be something that we can capture right now whether it's a determinate meaning or maybe something that's a bit more murky um and vague is perhaps another question but um if we're going to advert to mental states then um there has to be something for us that you know that we can say okay this person intended this right now whether that has to be a sort of a determinate meaning yeah, I kind of suppose it has to. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I need to, as as Georg would say, I need to have a think about that and come back. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any more um, questions, comments, concerns?
criticisms. Concerns. <laughs> and the wrong word, sorry. No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's pro probably right. But, uh... Is there anybody? Uh, yes, there was there's someone. Oh, uh, David. Uh, maybe Keith too. Maybe first David and then okay, Keith. Okay, so okay, okay, I, I I will leave uh, uh, space for Keith. Okay, sure. Uh, whoever yeah, goes okay, first, no, you're no, both. No problem, okay. No problem. okay, then please Keith. Okay, I I mean if I was a if I was a historian, um, one of the questions I might put to you is if there are all kinds of problems in relation to historical knowledge production, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with realism. Uh, and if there's a whole load of problematical thinking in relation to anti-realism, and if irrealism, which is sometimes put in the middle, which you did, has also got loads of problematical things about it as well, then in your view, if you have one, what would you suggest historians ought to do in order to produce historical knowledge and understanding beyond peradventure? What would historians ought to do? Nothing. Keep, you know, um, historical practice. Is, sorry, have I, mis have, I mis have I misread the question here? Well, um, my question is, in a positive way, it's easy to criticise, you know, we do it all the time. But if, <laughs> fun, you wanted to put something, but if you wanted to put something positive forward and say, if you wanted to produce historical knowledge beyond peradventure, which historians do, but you've criticized representation, you've criticized realism, anti-realism, irrealism, and so on, and I don't think you're an anti-representationist, which I think I am, then what I would want to know is, if I was a historian, what could you say to me, this is how you ought to proceed, if you want to get something called historical understanding and knowledge? If, okay. It's easy if you... to, what I'm saying, it's easy to criticize, but now, be, now, now pretend to be positive. <laughs> pretend to be positive. I love it. Um, okay, so basically, so my you know, so so I think that you know that we are entitled to take the knowledge and understanding that historians produce as being accurate in the sense of reflecting what act you know what happened in the past. Now, when we say what actually happened in the past, of course, it conjures up the specter of, uh, of, of you know, Ronka uh, uh, and all that. But, um, and I mean, I think this is one of the the, the problems with the, the sort of the Frank Ankishman view, the idea that, that historians literally represent, represent the past, you know, what historians do. And, and as you say, I couldn't put it better myself. They produce knowledge and understanding of the past, of what happened and why it happened. So what I kind of see my role as is that, you know, you have these theories like, you know, realism and stuff. And it says, well, historians do this, but you can't can't take it as reflecting what actually happened, you know, because we either constitute it or, you know, representational uh, structures distort it. You know, what I'm saying is that basically that we are entitled to say that, you know, look, this is, you know, historians reach a, a fairly certain conclusion about something what happened and this is the philosophical machinery that allow us to take it that actually it's not distorted or it's not part of our you know spun out of uh you know a product of the human mind that philosophically we are titled to say yes we can you know have co place confidence in what historians do and the type of knowledge that historical knowledge that historians produce mm -hmm. So if you come along and say, okay, you can have historical knowledge about certain forms of facticity, this or that happened, et cetera, et cetera, this moment in time. But when it comes to the problem of meaning, what do these events mean, which moves you away from facticity and uh, empiricism and so on into the realm of imagination and ideologies, and various ways of, because obviously, the facts do not determine the number of ways in which you can interpret. You can, you know, one one event, you know, a multiplicity of views about it in infinitum. Actually, there's no stopping. Uh, so historians can only go kind of halfway. Uh, they can produce sort of stuff, but when you ask meanings about that stuff, it seems to me that there's no way of answering the question. I mean, it could mean anything more or less. So you want it to mean within certain limits, within within a certain cultural setup, and so on and so forth. Uh, under certain descriptions and so on and so forth. But what so do we mean easy, by meaning here? Well, what do easy. we mean by meaning? 
Well, anything meaning is significant. I mean, meaning is significant. What is the meaning of the French Revolution? What is the meaning of the First World War? What is the meaning of Margaret Thatcher? What is the meaning of Adam Timmins giving this lecture? Oh, we don't want to get into that last one. <laughs> but well, I mean, I would argue that. But how um, would you? Where would you limit? Where would you limit the number of answers you can give to those questions? But but I think it's a very um, uh, not sort of esoteric concept of me, you know. But to argue would... for that, you, you know, you're talking about. I think if I'm right in interpreting this, we're talking about this. You know, what what can historians say about the significance? You know, is this what we mean by meaning? Right. What no, were the just... significance of these events? It's like, well, as you say, you can interpret it in a number of different ways, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's actually what, yeah, obviously some historians do it, but in terms of meaning, uh, you know, I would argue that historians are sort of, you know, addressing questions like, you know, by virtue of what factors did this happen? You know, how did this come to be? Were there alternatives? You know, in what way can these events to be linked together? I mean, the idea of the meaning of history strikes me as a sort of a throwback to the old speculative philosophy of history. Uh, you I'm know, what, what's I'm the meaning of it all? Yeah, I'm not suggesting no meaning. I'm just saying, how do you make it? How do you limit the number of interpretations and readings of any specific event? How can you stop those readings from continuing in infinitum? Which I don't think you can do. Uh, unless to be you fair, I never some... said you could. To be fair, I never said you could. Well, I mean, one of the things which you always attack in your writing is some form of relativism. I'm espousing relativism now. In fact, I'm espousing some form of nihilism. How would you answer the question that you have, let's just say, the Holocaust? Let's just say that it's a singular event. Let's just say that we don't disagree that it took place. Let's just say that it has these properties, these things occurred, et cetera, et cetera. I now ask the question, so what? And that's the interesting question, which historians can't answer. So what? It, it, and then they have to give an answer, which is just... But that's not their job particular... as historians. Isn't it? No, not to, oh. you know, so, sort of ponder, you know, historians produce knowledge and understanding about the past, right? But they, but, but they embody meanings. This is what these events meant. And the relativist argument isn't about facticity. It isn't about getting, you know, kind of, all the kind of uh, information which you've got about a particular set of events. We can all agree upon that. What you can't, what, what is very interesting is how do you limit the multiplicity of interpretations with any given event, in this case, the Holocaust? But this is the problem with irrealism, general, right? This is, this, this is the very problem with irrealism, right? That we can't agree about the events. This is what is being put forward. On the Goldstein yeah. view, different mm -hmm. accounts constitute different facts. Exactly. On the Roth view, non-aggregativity, non-detachability, all this stuff, different yeah. accounts, different facts. So, so we're talking about accounts here that actually, you know, not only say that we can't limit the, you know, the meanings, we can't limit the constitution of the events, right? That's right. That's right. Well, I, I, I recognize the first, and I'm asking you questions about the second part, the limits to meaning making. And if let, let, let me shortly interject. There are a few other people too. One question, yeah. was, please, Keith, and then one answer, and then we move along. And if there's time left, no, we can I, come I, back. I, it's a bit. No, I, it, can, I, it can't be a dialogue between the two of you if there are still other people <laughs> wanting to ask questions. I'm sorry. Do you want to ask one more thing? Or... No. Okay. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Move on. Okay. Then after we can come back to it if there's time and interest. Mm -hmm. David. And then there was Jack again. If there's time, or maybe Keith again. We'll see. David, please. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying the discussion. A lot of the questions were the questions I also would like to ask. But uh, let, let's go a little bit back to Goldstein. I I think you you were quite just to Goldstein. Uh, you said that you discussed uh, Goldstein's definition of evidence, and I do really think that the entire realism of Goldstein really stems from his conception of evidence. So perhaps if you if if you would like to attack Goldstein's entire realism, perhaps what would be your conception of evidence? How does evidence produce the knowledge of the past? Because Goldstein, Goldstein I think conception is has some uh, has some advantages, like being able to explain how the historians progressively are able to use different uh, types of evidence, how they can discover new information in evidence they already had, et cetera, et cetera. So how would, what would be your conception of evidence and how does evidence relate to historical knowledge? In okay, some well, realist... firstly, 
Firstly, let me give a, a cheap plug that if you want to hear David talking about Goldstein, as indeed you want to hear me talking about colleg colligation, then there's a conference in uh, at the start of May in Norway, right? Um, so, you know, stay tuned, listeners. <laughs> with regards to um, the problem I have with, let me just turn my other, just turn my monitor on because I want to refer to something. <clears throat> um, yeah, while I was giving this talk, Stormy Daniels popped up on one of the other TV screens, which was a slightly bizarre juxtaposition of, <laughs> of, of content. Um, the, the, the worry I have, well, I mean, I have a lot of worries with Goldstein's view. I mean, the first is this kind of hard sort of presentism, right? Um, and, you know, it's what I've called the, uh, you know, the, the wide-eyed and legless view of, um, you know, historical evidence. Historical, the historian comes along and goes, oh my gosh, look, a pile of evidence. I wonder what this could be evidence for, right? And I mean, Goldstein buttresses that, you know, if you notice Goldstein's examples are all from archaeology, right? And I mean, that's, you know, that really is a situation where you find a rock in a field. Um, you know, and you're kind of asking how that it got there. But, um, you know, first of all, I just wonder if that kind of sort of strict presentism is really sort you know, what, what's the kind of gap, you know, where, you know, so let's say I do some work today, 24 hours passes, it's tomorrow, you know, have I got to constitute the events of the pre, you know, are, are, are we constantly constituting, right? But the... The thing with that struck me when I was looking at Goldstein this time around is that he he seems to um, ascribe to a view of what I would call the univocality of evidence, right? Or at least he 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 ascribes to the realist, right? So on Goldstein view, it seems to me anyway, the realist says, well, this is a piece of evidence for one thing and one thing only, right? Is that fair to? I would probably need to think about it. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, but, but you can continue. I, I, I oh, okay. would but, like to, but I mean, that's what it comes across the whole to me. And I mean, I know there is one <laughs> there is one historian, at least, who ascribed to this. I seem to remember Jeffrey Elton complaining that uh, the anal, you know, because the, the analysis historians used Inquisition records, right, to um, to reconstruct medieval social life. And I seem to remember Elton complaining that, you know, this was a somehow a misuse of the sources. But this is very much a one-off. I think if... If Goldstein wants to argue that, you know, in order to be a realist about, you know, the past, you have to say that, well, look, this is evidence and evidence for one thing only. I would say no. Um, you know, something can be evidence for, uh, you know, a multiplicity of things, you know, to use sort of common uh, analytic term philosophy, you know, uh, several truths can have the same truth maker. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and I, and I say Goldstein kind of beats that horse a lot, right? Flogs that horse a lot, right? The idea that, you know, evidence has to be classified and it has to be evidence for something, right? Which, okay, fair enough, it does. But, you know, from that, Goldstein seems to take the idea that, well, you know, realism, you know, it's almost like as soon as we start conceptualizing, the realist cause is lost, right? As soon as we have to make a choice to classify something, and of course the way Roth takes it is, well, there are no, you know, uh, social kinds are inherently unstable and stuff, but I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Any follow up, David? Otherwise, um, there we have two. I think Jack wants to speak again, and I think Keith had another comment or question too. So um, I would suggest first, and uh, maybe if there's anybody else who hasn't spoken yet, I mean, you both are. Well, you're welcome to still ask questions or have comments. But first, is there anybody else who didn't say anything yet? Otherwise, I'd suggest we take it in a row. First, Jack and then Keith, and then maybe again Adam or in between Adam, and then we can think about if we draw it to a close. OK, then I guess, unless there's a question otherwise at the moment, and there's also afterwards the possibility. Jack first, again, please. Thanks. I guess uh, I'm actually wanting to circle back around to stuff that Keith was saying. Um, because it seems to me like, although you say you're not placing restrictions on historians, inevitably, um, a realist account um, will. And I wonder what you make of this. It seems like if you have um, an ontology of meaning or an ontology of events, then at some point you're going to be charged with, I suppose, 
hiding from the historian what they're actually missing because you're going to be saying well you know if Gaddis says that there was this long piece that stretched between 45 and 91 um and he wants to refer to that as if it's an event that he's actually doing something he's 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 misdescribing he hasn't actually referred to anything um and it's not the job only of the historians to argue with him as to whether or not you know the long piece is in any way a useful uh descriptor um, because of everything that happened right in Asia or Latin America, but rather it's the job of the philosophers to tell uh, to tell Gaddis that he's going wrong. Whereas, and you know, Keith mentioned uh, nihilism. Um, it seems like with with Roth, you know, like you just have the historians, the descriptors. Um, there's a unity in the sense that what historical explanation gives us is um, an account of uh, a temporal sequence that's retrospective. Um, and then you have normative constraints, which maybe white um, or a nihilist wouldn't give you, in that already amongst the community of historians, they have normative constraints on what it makes, what makes for a, a, an explanative narrative. So I, I just wonder first on the on the question of whether or not you think realist accounts have an ontological problem there, as I described it, and whether or not you think um, something like Roth surrealism um, actually has normative constraints that are adequate. Uh, have a long, an ontological problem in the sense that, um, well, the philosopher of history um, prescribes certain ontological forms. Is that sorry, Matt? Um, well, I suppose you know, like uh, I'm just trying to see where, where, because you, you talked about restriction. Sorry, where? So where's the restrictions? Where are the restrictions coming from? Well, I suppose. Um, what counts as an event in your in your ontology of events? It seems like Roth just wants to go, well, you know, ordinary language, we, we, we cut up events as, as we like. Um, you tell me what you mean by events, and then we can start talking about <laughs> this, what historians refer to. Whereas if you have a robust ontology of events, you're going to be saying, presumably, that some historians are going wrong. Well, I, I think the problem with the, the problem I have with, with Roth's theory of events is that it's very sort of um hand waving i mean in, uh, i mean he talks about actions uh, in a bit more detail but in event you know in terms of events we just get this scattered sort of thing of oh well we can we can slice them as thick or thin as any way we um please um and so i think the majority of this well i mean historians in general tend to be a bit agnostic don't they about um colligatory concepts and things like that but you know again what i'm doing is providing an alternative is saying that look actually we can be committed to an ontology of events and therefore that we are inclined to take, you know, we don't have to say that colligatory concepts are just, you know, they're all uh, subject sided, as Joni would put it. Um, uh, so I don't see where the restriction comes in on the, the historian, on the practice. Where does the restriction come in on the practicing historian? Um well, I mean, I just repeat the example I gave. With, with Gaddis refers to a long piece. That's a, that's an that's an event. Okay, so so if Gaddis is wrong, does that invalidate? His, is that is that where we're going with, with this? So, well, so you have you have a robust metaphysical account to give of, of something like action or something like events, and it, it 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 seems to me like it's not good enough to be like well. Um, we have our philosophy, we have our robust ontology, and then we have what historians do. If you have a robust ontology, then what historians do surely has to um, correlate with what your ontology tells you if they're going to be in the business of describing events. The problem is, though, that in, in appealing to what the, uh, like I say, historians tend to be very sort of uh, agnostic. I mean, this is the thing, right? I started out as a historian, right? and and then i moved into the philosophy of history and and i think it's fair to say that the majority of historians are realists to an extent but you know whenever i give papers to historians about you know the reality the uh, the reality of the of the renaissance or whatnot um you know what the attitude i tend to find is agnosticism you know it's like oh yeah it might be real it might be not but until you start talking about the holocaust and then it suddenly becomes much more turbocharged but um so, sorry, I'm just trying to, to, to get my head around this argument. So, Gaddis postulates a, so in other words, ontological categories that the historian employs can have an effect on practice. Is that what we're 
Yeah, and, and, yeah. and my, my contention would be that the historians wouldn't be so agnostic if actually they realized that um, the account of historical knowledge that the realist presents means that some historians are going wrong, not because their peers disagree with them, um, but because um, they're just misdescribing mis mis the fundamental structure of reality. Well, they might well be misdescribing the fundamental structure of reality. And, you know, if if they are, then, you know, that's for the, um, you know, for the historical community to, you know, to decide or lack thereof. But it needs to be sort of buttressed by appropriate ontological arguments, because otherwise, otherwise we get into this sort of Leon Goldstein thing where, oh, you know, the, this all falls out of historical practice. So, so I think there is a, I think there is a way for the historian to go wrong in terms of their postulation of ontology, if that's what we're driving at. Okay, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating discussion. It can be continued, obviously, but um, I'm, it's, yeah, I'm also fascinated by it, whether or not we need an event ontology for historiography or not, or we can do without. Um, but is there any other question other than Keith? Um, otherwise, he can also ask one more time to somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Can I, can I just make a quick point about event ontology? If, uh, if you wish, yes. But then I let me, can I ask, then can I sh shortly make my point? That no, okay. What, okay. what is uh, about? No, no, we'll hold it. We'll hold it back. We'll hold it back. Um, I've, I've you, talked enough. Um, right. Um, I, well, then let me ask that shortly. Uh, then, 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 then Keith and then we can to okay. a close so we can um, continue if people want. Um, so one question is, um, you said there are fairly standardized descriptions in historiography too about the revolution and war and, and, and so forth, and you gave some certain examples. So there's some form of standardization, okay. Um, but my question- in, in, the sense of, in the sense of agreement okay. as to what occurred. Um, yes, okay, but this, this is different, but this is exactly what I think my previous speaker also said. Agreement is fine, that exists. Nobody, hardly anybody would disagree with that. But do we need to cash that out in a very, very strong event ontology? Because I think an event ontology, maybe even the natural sense, but they can at least do experiments so you can standardize those up to a certain extent in the experimental sciences. Um, we get into very hard water what an event is and how do we differentiate events from each other. Um, and my, my point is not to be an anti-realist about what happened in the past necessarily, if the historians agree and to do it by the evidentiary practices by which they infer knowledge. My point is we, don't, we might not need a, a event ontology for that. And maybe event ontology just give, um, does, uh, it, it, it's, it's insubstantial to, 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 to inferring that the first world will happen in this and this way. Why that's clear, what, and we don't need to describe the first world war as an event, for instance, or maybe you would describe it as an event, but it's a very interesting form of event and what this means then. So my point is, I guess my point is we can be realist if the evidentiary practices work out and event ontology will still be redundant to what the historian is doing. And we, and we get into more hot water and more problems with event ontology than without. But if, we, if we don't have an event on ontology, then what prevents it from collapsing into anti-realism or because this is the so this this kind of ties into the point i wanted to make anyway right um and the point i will make in a few weeks uh, after i've been to chicago <laughs> and we um so we have these you know things postulated right particularly colligatory concepts right the french revolution first world war blah 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 and we're told that these are indispensable to historiography but normally when something is you know deemed indispensable you know, it means that it has some existence, right? That, you know, that we literally can't do without this. You know, this is particularly um, Juni's view, I think. Whereas in, um, you know, a lot of these sort of arguments for colligatory anti-realism, it's like, well, we, we need these colligatory concepts, but they don't actually pick anything out. And so it's like, well, well, what work are they doing? And of course, the answer is, you know, organization, you know, which is which strikes me as a... Um, you know, we're on the slippery slope to to anti-realism here. So how can we be realists about the First World War in terms of the sense that, you know, this has a, you know, concrete, for lack of a better word, structure without appealing to event ontology? Right. Uh, we can. OK. Um, yeah. Well, no, I'm happy with the answer for the moment. Um, Yes, the, the question is, can we delineate events well enough and so on? But yeah, we don't need to get into this. It's a bit also advanced by time. But one more, um, 
of course, Keith is still on the list, and maybe as the last. Okay. Um, but please go ahead. Okay. I, um, I mean, just picking up something you said uh, in your last kind of answer, really, is that uh, when you talked about anti-realism, something which you might collapse into. Uh, I don't mind collapsing into anti-realism because it uh, gives you a certain amount of freedom, in fact, an enormous amount of freedom, to construe the, the events which have happened in the past, the occurrences, the happenings, and so on, in a multiplicity of ways, which can be then put together in order to inform a critique of academic historical practices. So why is it a collapse as opposed to an exhilarating escape? Because if, okay. because if we want an exhilarating escape, we can write works of fiction. Well, what are historians writing, if not works which are fictive in the sense of constructed, made? I mean, it's not as though you can find a history out there. It's not as if, it's as if I can walk down the street and find a history. I have to create one. I have to produce one. And there are no limits to the ways in which I can do that production. There's no so, so sci stuff. scientists create theories too. So does that mean that you know the fact that you know scientific yeah. theories don't fall out of a helicopter? Do, you know, are they in the same boat or? Yes, they're in a similar boat. Everything's created. <laughs> they're they're fictive. No, well, what's given? What everything's fictive, created, right. invented, okay. produced. And and what you what historians want to do is to say, yeah, but there's a certain kind of mode of production, which you have to kind of. Um, adhere to, which can be a form of kind of empirical uh, empirical realism, if you like. But and then and then historians see alternatives to that, and realism, irrealism, and so on and so forth, <clears> as something which is a collapse. Something which, yeah, of course, it's a critique. But what's wrong with critique? What's wrong with being cynical? What's wrong with being skeptical? What's wrong with being relativistic in relation to the ways in which the world can be put together? What are you scared of? I mean, what are you scared of? <laughs> no, I, mean, it, I, I mean, a lot of... Uh, do I look scared? Do I look terrified okay. by this? You know. I know you're terrified. A lot of the things we should write about are anti-relativism. What's wrong with relativism? It's kind of inevitable. There are a multiplicity of views about any particular subject to which because, there are no limitations in common. Because so, the problem with relativism is that we get this situation that we've got in America now where we've got, you know, people, you know, Donald Trump, you know, denying the election. And I mean, this, and I think Aviator Tucker wrote about this a few years ago, is that this is like you know, this is the end result of, of, of postmodernism, right? Except the irony, of course, is that postmodernism was largely construed, you know, that this was going to be a big boon to the left, but it's actually the right wing that have taken up, you know, the, 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 the literal denial of reality, mm. right? That's the problem. That's the worry. <laughs> Right. I don't think I. You see, I don't think that I don't think that uh, anti-realists, in the way which I construct people like White or Angus Smith and so on, or other people you might suggest um, uh, are, are anti-realists and so on. I don't think there's any problem that they they don't deny actuality. What they deny is that there is some kind of connection of a logical kind between actuality and reality. I don't construct actuality, the stuff, the rocks, the trees, you know, the, you know, whatever it is, the cosmos, the universe, etc. I don't that's not a product of my current mental state or anybody else's current mental state, I don't think. So we're all kind of realists in that sense. But what we are then saying is that although we're realist in that sense, meanings don't follow from stuff. What has to be produced to, to, to constitute a reality is to give meanings to stuff which stuff may or may not have, and there's no way of checking. And that leads you to a relativism in terms of accounts always, because there is not, I mean, you can put it in a logical sense, there's no, there's no uh, entailment between fact and value, or is and ought, or stuff and the way stuff can be constructed into meanings through categorizations, classifications, conceptualizations, and so on. And different cultures in different places in space and time have constructed worlds, realities, relative to actualities. But the actualities themselves are just there, waiting to be appropriated. Now, what kind of, and, and that seems to me to be, yeah, if that's relativism, that just seems to me just something which is plainly so obvious that I can't worry about it. I don't worry about it. I just take that as a given. Then I produce 
what a philosophical arguments I have, you know, I need to have at hand in, in any particular situation, but I don't worry about it. It just seems to me to be obviously the case. There's an actuality of stuff, and then there are ways of constructing it, reading it, producing it, living through it, which constitutes a reality for me, you, other people, etc., in given social situations. But, the, but this is, of course... Me... Yeah. Sorry, so two points. So first of all, but this is actually, this is literally what Goodman is arguing, though, right? He's saying that there is no actuality, you know, there's, oh, there, there, there might be, be some... He's not, no. actually, he's not arguing there isn't stuff. He's arguing there's nothing in stuff which tells us how to, how, how to uh, think about it, do things with it pragmatically act in relation to but, it. But then that's not irrealism. That's that's good old-fashioned idealism. Well, but, okay. <laughs> so, okay. And so, so to, to, to bring it all back to the to, to the start of the talk, you know, the, the, this is the whole thing of Ross, right? This is the point that he makes, you know, very clearly, you know, this is not anti-realism. This is not realism. This is irrealism. But yeah. it's not, you know, it's... And I mean, look, he's not, he's not the first philosopher to have, you know, um, proclaimed to come up with a so-called third way. I mean, you know, John McDowell, Mind and World, you know, right? Um, as, well, don't worry about, don't Sobel. worry about, don't worry about Roth. Just like, can I answer the question? Okay, well, yeah, so that's my relative, first. So, so, so that you, if relative isn't obvious in the way in which I've just described, why worry about it? But I don't think it is. I don't think it is obvious. I think okay. that's one of our, you know, points of disagreement. But the second thing I would say to come back onto your other point is that so. So, how, so explain to me how stuff has intrinsic meaning, such that we can recognise it. But okay, this is this is the the root of our disagreement. I think is that we're talk, so we're into the realm now of a distinction between fact and value, right? Yes. Right. So, you know, what what does it all mean? And, and like I say, call me a, you know, retrograde, uh, dull headed realist. But, you know, yes, consent, okay. you know, oh, gosh, what do, yeah, OK, fine. I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I'll, I'll own it. You know, that's not a problem. <laughs> but, yes. the, you know, questions like, you know, gosh, what does it all mean? Uh, you know, are those is that really the province of the historian? I'm not saying that. I'm simply asking you if there is nothing intrinsic. No natures, no essence, no, nothing in nature, nothing in the world out there, which determines what it is that we shall do with that nature when we come across it in various settings. That leads to me to think that you could that, that what you're doing there is just kind of creating worlds, if you like, creating views of the world, just pragmatically ways of getting around in the world, in the sense in which Rorty uses, for example, the way in which we get around in the world uh, by simply kind of producing, inventing pragmatic ways of just sort of coping. Oh, and, okay. Um, and I should I have, worry. I have to... A problem. Shortly, I interfere, shortly, shortly interfere again. We've got a spirit of defense of... Yeah, I can see Whatever it is, relativism, anti-realism, however you call it again, <laughs> it's great too to have that here. I suggest we give um, Adam, again, if you want to answer one more time with what Keith was saying here, the last chance to answer, and then we'll draw it to a close. It's um, nearly... Two hours here and it was great we had a long discussion after not so long talk that's really good good sign too so i suggest adam if you want to address anything either keep said or anybody else said still then it's now it's your you have to you got the last word here no i mean i i suspect that you know uh, the, there is a fundal, fundamental dis disagreement between me and keith which we, we wouldn't be able to resolve in two minutes <laughs> at least so um no i, I say i think I'm, I'm happy with you know with what i've said Okay, then it just remains for me to be sa to see. I uh, say um, thank you, everybody, for joining tonight, and thank you, especially Adam, for your talk. And we'll see for those interested again on the 11th of April on the philosophy of time and the philosophy of history. Thanks again, and see you all. all right. Bye bye. Cheers.